Hi, this is Gilbert Godfrey. <laughs> it's going to be a rough one. I'm drinking coffee for this. Yeah, okay. This is Gilbert Godfrey, and I'm here with my co host, Frank Santo Padre, and our engineer, Frank Verderosa. And this is Gilbert Gottfried's amazing, colossal podcast. Our guest this week is a singer, occasional recording artist, and one of the most popular and respected actresses of her generation. You know her work from TV shows like Entourage, Law and Order, SVU, Family Guy, Frasier, Mom, Cougar Town, and The Simpsons. As country songstress, Lorleen Lumpkin. <laughs> She's also so delivered far, memorable good. performances in features mm, like Hair, Coal Miner's Daughter, Every Which Way But Loose, Honky Tonk Freeway, High Spirits, Illuminata, yeah. American History X. And, and then everything uh, from 2000 is shit. No, sorry. <laughs> Wait, sorry. No, I'm just worried that like people will be going, when, what was that like? Oh, yeah, that was last century. I'm sorry. Have we started? Did we start yet? Yeah, he's, just, just, he's just going to wrap it up. <laughs> okay. Okay. It really. We'll get to I, that. And of course. I am working. <laughs> I am alive. I am working. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, as Clark Griswold's long suffering wife, Ellen Griswold, in five National Lampoon vacation films. In a long and celebrated career, she's shared the big and small screen with Clint Eastwood, Alan Arkin, Peter O'Toole, <laughs> Woody Allen, Jack Nicholson, Robert Preston, <laughs> Christopher Plummer. And the late Burt Reynolds, who called oh, yeah. her a combination of Gene Arthur and Gene Harlow. They're dead, too. <laughs> <laughs> In a law... Oh, she's also... <laughs> she also worked with Silver. <laughs> <laughs> it's I know it's keep going. Okay. <laughs> She's also worked with several of our previous guests, including yes. Chevy Chase, Amy Heckling, Buck Henry, yes. Ileana yes. Douglas, Keith yes. Ka- Keith Carradine. All true. Paul Dooley. Yep. Ed Bagley Jr. Oh yes. Many but, times. But, and John Aston. And John and Andrew, Aston. Andrew Bergman. And Andrew Bergman. Andrew Bergman. And Andrew yeah, Bergman. Aston. 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 Yeah, but, I'm like three degrees of separation. <laughs> but wait, there's more. And listen to the guy she slept with. <laughs> <laughs> she's, a, she's also a gift. Thank you so- for tuning in. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> She's also a gifted songwriter and singer. <laughs> and, and, and the, <laughs> Even I'm laughing at this and, resume. And, and the winner of, I lost my place here. Oh, the, the winner. winner of Country Music Association <laughs> Award. The and Golden you, Reel Award. Or no, wait. The Golden Globe, Satellite Award, Emmy nomination, um, uh... I've been getting some Lifetime Achievements Awards lately. <laughs> I, you know, and I really, I, I just show up, I don't even know why, and they, they really don't either. It's just, you know, they had to get somebody they couldn't get Renda Vaccaro or something. Renda Vaccaro. <laughs> let, let them explain who you are here. Okay. They should have figured it out by now. cares. <laughs> and you could hear her perform in her own voice. No Marnie Nixon here, folks. Oh, well, how did hair. you know about Marnie Nixon? <laughs> we know a lot of stuff. <laughs> you know, I, she was in the repertory company I was in, in Canada. And I uh, would, it, when you're in a repertory company, you do, like, you star in one show. It was my boost to Broadway. That's a story. Marnie Nixon was in the company, and she gave vocal lessons on the weekends. Yeah. I do know Marnie <laughs> Nixon. Okay. She knew Marnie Let's Nixon. See. Yeah. In Hair, Coal Miner's Daughter, Honky Tonk Freeway. The in mid- the mood. 
<laughs> what? I did the soundtrack for In the Mood. Yes, oh. right. In the Mood. Put that in there. The Mood. In the Mood. In the Mood. <laughs> <laughs> the Miracle. Patrick Dempsey's debut. Yes. Good little movie. Who cares? Who cares? Daddy's Everybody, dying. you've lost everyone. <laughs> no, you've they're lost all this everyone long. They're now. all this They've long, moved Beverly. on to another podcast now. It's not... Cut to that part. Okay. <laughs> What's the, the hell last with the other stuff you've done? <laughs> Please welcome to the podcast oh. <laughs> a performer of numerous talent <laughs> and a woman who says that despite being as Italian as they come, yep. she's never been offered a real Italian role. Never. <laughs> Oh, am I supposed to not be talking? <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Beverly D'Angelo. I'm exhausted. It's nice to meet you, and I'll see you next time. <laughs> okay. uh, thank you. That was very kind. That was that was really, really sweet and very, very flattering that you would go to so much trouble to try to find something that would make people want to listen. I appreciate it. <laughs> I really appreciate You're it. You're far too modest, Beverly. Now, I don't think we ever officially met. We didn't. No. We didn't officially meet. But we but. both took part in the Friars Club <laughs> che- roast of Chevy Chase. Yes, we did. Which... Uh, when was that? That was like, I know it was right after I had kids. So I think it was like 2000 and... Because I was like weighing about 500 pounds strutting around the stage. And it was right... Uh, was that like 2001 or 2002 or something? Mm, right around yeah, there. It was a while right ago, ago, certainly. It, it, yeah, it was It was a while ago, but those kinds of burns, you know, leave scars that one doesn't forget. That was that was deadly. It 2002, was, actually. It, it, 2002, was, yeah. it was very weird because, I mean, I guess, you know, it's funny. Chevy, who I don't know him as well as you do, but... I worked with him once, and I've socialized. And what? Oh, what did you? What did you do with him? Oh, I did one scene and one crappy movie that nobody ever saw, and it was what never was released. It? A, uh, Jack and the Beanstalk. Jack and the Beanstalk. Oh, the, with James Karen. Uh, yes. Yeah. Really? Yeah. 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 Well, that's cool. Yeah. But um, and, and I you socialized can, with him. Yeah, and with mm. with Chevy. I can use that classic line, which is, well, he was always nice to me. (laughs) (laughs) Good for you. (laughs) Yeah. Good for you. And, and, uh, but, but see, I, I know I, he certainly had a, a reputation in the business. You know, I've had, I mean, I've known Chevy since 1982. And I've worked with him, not just on the five vacation movies, but on a national campaign for um, Old Navy. And also we were like this figurehead or whatever it is for some rental company, Home Away or whatever. Um, and we're close friends and socially. And he, he has a place close to mine in Los Angeles, uh, I mean, our, our, our paths are, are linked, you know, we're... we're, we're we're very, I'd say we're very, very close friends. I, I say that I, I think I know him very well. He, he always called me his, uh, his, his movie wife or something like that. But I mean, I've been with him as long as his wife has been in, and, and the professional level only. But um, I've oh I have a lot of theories about Chevy's behavior. I have a lot of theories about the dynamics that he creates. I've I've uh, always been fascinated by uh, how he can kind of always get to the same place, no matter what he's doing. But you know, here's should I go into it? I mean, yes, do, do yes. Get, okay. Well, here's the thing: you got to remember that I met che- I just done Coal Miner's Daughter. And there was a lot of stuff happening. You know, I'd hit Hollywood and I was like on fire and blah, 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 blah. And so I got this script and um, 
uh, it was like, you know, I was 29 at the time and I was supposed to be mother of teens and, and, uh, there was a dog in it, you know, you're supposed to work with kids or dogs. And, and I thought that's kind of fast to go to mothers. Like I haven't even started in a movie yet. Well, I'd done this movie with Burt Reynolds, but that doesn't count. It's kind of like on the same level as Jack and the Beanstalk probably. But, um, <laughs> so, <laughs> right? like those films, <laughs> the cinema, the shin. So, uh, so anyway, um, but I was married to an Italian duke at the time and he read he said oh, Beverly this is so hilarious look at this cousin Eddie he's so funny <laughs> and look at this a dead woman on top of the car ha <laughs> it's hilarious you do it so so I did and we shot it all on location so we were kind of in a bubble so my introduction to Chevy and Harold and John Hughes was in this bubble of and I, I actually saw that film First of all, I wasn't the only person. It was a satire. It was it was a satire, and the anticipated audience was going to be the Saturday Night Live crowd who'd made the National Lampoon's Delta House, you know, a big hit. And uh, it was a satire uh, as opposed to just like a comedy. But I, I saw it as a romantic comedy, and I saw it as a love story. I always saw it as a oh, love interesting. story. Interesting. Yeah. So that that really that that helped me make the. The, the character real. I just thought, well, this is my mom. You know, I can do that. Even though I was so different, my personality was so different. My lifestyle was so different. Everything was so different. But I met him in the context of this. This was a guy who, when we did that first vacation, if we were driving down the street, you know, for a, like a driving shot in the car, people would go, che- I'm Chevy Chase and you're not. Like in every restaurant, the waiter would go, I'm Dave, you're waiter for the night. I'm Chevy Chase and you're not. Or I'm Dave and you're not. Or, you know, I mean, just it was all... Oh, you know, he was really peaking. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, second one, we were in Europe, not so much recognition there, but still everything was built around Chevy. So I saw a lot of people who, you know, he, he, his humor, he has a humor. His his style of humor is I'm smarter than you. And if you don't get it, you're a dope. And, you know, it's kind of like waspy, you know, he has a style. And I did watch a lot of people around him over the years kind of go, yeah, <laughs> and laugh at the put downs of them to go along with it. And then he had the talk show. And it was like, to me, it was like Captain Cook. You know, like everybody had idolized Captain Cook so much they thought he was a god, and then he stumbled on a little stone and he bled, and all the natives just pulled out knives and started stabbing it. They were so furious, but they were the ones who had catapulted him to that to that godlike status, and once they saw he was human, and the talk show didn't work, he didn't work in that format, it was like the knives were out, and I... I I think as a performer and as a as a person, it'd be hard not to react to that. Chevy was a writer. Chevy started out as a sure. as a writer, and all the cameras, like you know how how they have all those cameras on a baseball field that are all aimed at the players, and then whenever there's a celebrity in the crowd, you see that all the cameras turn around. All the cameras had turned around to Chevy. You know, he was really under scrutiny, and uh, I don't think he ever prepared for that. I don't think he ever thought of himself as a performer and just was kind of winging it. But I, I do love Chevy, and I've worked with him forever. We even tried to do a pilot together. That was bad. And and the thing that's weird is he he was so mean. He was so messed up on the pilot. And I was like, what? And everybody around him was really mean to me, too. I think they were like, you know, like how a dog, if if he can't, like, like I have these dogs, okay? I have a bunch of dogs. <laughs> and, and, and I observed this, and I thought of Chevy because... Oh, uh, and they're little dogs. So I keep them inside a lot. But I have gardeners, too. And so I had this one dog, and the gardener was really close to the back door. He was trying to, like, you know, mow and blow, you know, like, uh, uh, I don't even know why I pay him. But anyway, um, <laughs> so there were all these leaves, and they're getting rid of the leaves, and he's, and the gardener's really close to the back door. And my dog was growling and leaping at the door trying to get at this invader, right? But he was frustrated by the door and he couldn't and I saw him start to gnaw his paw you know so I felt like 
there were many times when I was working with Chevy over the years, many, many, many times, that I would get the kind of anxiety and the the anger even that that really wasn't directed at me, but it was it was kind of like the overflow from things that they were afraid to deal with Chevy over. So Chevy, Chevy really never even had realistic, or you know, it's hard for him to have realistic relationships with people. You know, they're they're anticipating. They know what he's going to say, or they know who he is. There's a lot of prejudice going to that guy. He, he's, a, he's a good guy. He's a family man. He's got three daughters, a wife he loves. He's been married to her for 32 years. You know, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot to say about his core values, but yeah, he can be a dick. And, and I you mean, know. and I'll just have to say once again, he was uh, nice to me. Yeah, oh, we had him, nice yeah. to we, me. We had him on the show. Yeah. He was great. Yeah. I, yeah. I've, I've only seen his good side, I'm happy yeah. to say. Yeah, he's got a good side. And but the roast side. was really. Oh my god! I, I I I've never seen anything like that. It was it eviscerated. But I think it's because the people didn't know him enough to make you know really uh, um, pertinent jokes. It was just they look on a piece of paper, see he's been busted for that. Not the the recurring theme of the back pills joke. It was like how, how many times can you call somebody a drug addict? You know, ha ha ha. You know, it, it just, I, I don't know. Gilbert, you I were there, but you didn't perform? No, I don't think I performed. No, I think you had to have said, you had to have yes. said something. Oh, did? You must have. Oh. Paul I, was the roast master, yeah, as we talked I, about. I, I Paul guess, was the roast I guess master. I guess I performed then. But well, it was also, that was the second time he'd done it. Yeah. He had done it before, so maybe they were kind of like fresh out of the fresh jokes. But I think that he was really hurt by, because the resounding image was, here's a guy who's addicted to all kinds of drugs, ha ha. You know what I mean? There, there wasn't like, uh, you know, it didn't have the... I don't know. Yeah, it, was it, it wasn't like like a roast where it's your friends, it, right? Tearing that's you to what shreds. It was. Okay, you've said it. That's it. I hear I'm talking fifty five words per one. <laughs> well, the only pre- people that and really knew just, him were it wasn't you. His friend. You and Lorraine were I really the only people that had history with him. Wow, well, uh, uh, Paul did. By, well, Paul, right? The roast master, you and Lorraine Newman, and everybody else was sort of a Comedy wow. Central comic. Of course, like a typical yes, that's roast. It too. Yeah. A typical roast has old people you've known, your cronies, all and that. And so you can really say something funny, but yeah. you, there's love there. Yeah, yes. and they can yeah, there's just they can hatred there. You for Chevy. <laughs> and then it's yeah. fine. What did yeah. you mean, Beverly, when you said you had his, you had Chevy's number when you first met him? Because I've heard you say that did in interviews. Did I say that? Yeah. Uh, I had Chevy's number when I first met him. Uh, well, I know that when that that when we met. Um, uh, he sure looked familiar to me because he was, I saw, uh, my background was very different from his, how I ended up in Hollywood is very different from his. And, um, I'd kind of like come in through music and even just like, you know, singing in bar bands and strip clubs and all this kind of, I mean, I saw a whole different way of life than like a college graduate would. Sure. But there were these really, really bright, like, I like to say that I was singing in a topless bar when Meryl Streep was in the Yale Repertory Company. <laughs> and we That's know about of, the topless. Was my, bar with a trapeze. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, that was my that. college. <laughs> so, but any of my perform my my art studies. Um, but anyway, you know, he. There were all these really, really smart guys that just kind of invaded Hollywood from Harvard. Mm-hmm. And although Chevy so, didn't go to Harvard, they loved him. Yeah, I think he won the aristocrat joke, which Gilbert has like the best version of in history. <laughs> Thank but I think you. That, he yeah, does. yeah, it's true. But Chevy, I think you know, won one of those things and endeared himself to all those guys. I, I, I probably am not getting the history right, but the point is, these were smart, middle upper middle class. Doug white Kenny, boys. Ramis, all of those yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah. Chris Miller. I, I got that. I, I, I knew who they were. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. How did you wind up with an Italian Duke? Because I starred in the film of Hair, and the film of Hair opened the Cannes Film Festival in 1979, and we went, and like, you know, when you when, when your film opens the Cannes Film Festival, it's a really big deal, and everybody gives you yachts and stuff, so uh, kind of en masse, uh, Mila Schwarman, the director, and myself, and most of the cast, took a yacht to Saint-Tropez, and uh, of this fantastic woman arrived, her name is Princess Claudia Ruspoli, and we were sitting 
sitting there having dinner, and Milos started singing, um, you know that that Italian song. Oh, sure, everybody knows it. <laughs> um, Stromboli, da 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 da. Oh yeah, da. yeah, right. Okay, so Milos started singing Claudia Ruspoli. She spreads her legs for me, and then she comes on me just like a Stromboli, which is a big <laughs> volcano. <laughs> and she she threw a glass of wine in his face. Wow. And I just thought this is the most fantastic person in the world. I want to be your best friend. So um, I befriended her immediately, and we started talking. And she said, "You know, my cousin Lorenzo goes to school at USC, studying economics there. Um, you should look him up." And so when I went back to LA, it was really not much longer after that. I was at a birthday party at the Roosevelt Hotel, and uh, the and it, there were a lot of crashers there, and I was talking to this gorgeous man who looked like a Greek god. And uh, the the uh, birthday boy came in, and he said, it's midnight, and I don't want to sell I want everybody that I know in that room, and, and, and everybody that I don't know has to stay in this room. There are too many crashers. And, uh, and he goes, Beverly, that means you. Leave this room. And I looked at this guy beside me. He goes, don't go. And I didn't. I took him home, and it was Lorenzo, the cousin of this woman that I'd met in Cannes. And we just kind of, we eloped seven months later. Does it make you a duchess if you actually become, yes. if you're married to a duke? That's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. That's yeah. pretty cool. Oh, no, I'm in the, uh, I'm in, I'm in like the books, you know, like the, the mm-hmm. heirs of Europe. Sure. If you look it up, yeah, I'm there. We actually stayed married for 15 years. Nobody in Hollywood knew that, but I was, I was married from 81 to 96. I did live with other people during that time. <laughs> so did he. <laughs> because the thing is, when we got married, we were young, you know. I mean, I'd only had one film out when 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 we got married, and and I I always thought I was going to be a singer, and I didn't know if the acting. Th- I mean, I didn't care that much. About right, right, right. So who knew? And he was a student, so our vow was that we would end up together. <laughs> but the the culture <laughs> owes him a debt of gratitude for you being in the vacation movies, and so do I. Right. Right. You know, yeah, yeah. You said something in an interview that I really identified with, that you were basically saying, I, because I always say I had stupidity on my side when I was starting out. Yeah. And you were saying something basically like that way too. Uh, that yeah, you just were... blind and courage. Yeah. Courage. I, 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 I wasn't afraid of anything. I hadn't learned, you know, what to be afraid of. There were just so many interesting things to do and, and, and try out and be. And I just seemed to be one of those people who could, you know, go, I can do that. Oh, I need to tap dance. Okay. Oh, I need to sing. Okay. Oh, I need to act. Okay. That kind of thing. But as things got more, I, I really kind of honestly, by 81, I was pretty well like done with Hollywood. And uh, I lived in Italy. I was based in Italy. I kept working all the time, but I, I was based in Italy from 81 to 86. And then I was based in Ireland from 86 to 90. So I was out of the country, just kind of flying to wherever I'd have a job. Um, for whatever reason, I wasn't really, I'm not one of those ambitious kind of actresses. Well, I've heard I you say that not... you, you never had a career plan, a, a real no. a, a, a plan that just sort of things happen. You're, you're no, essentially you lazy. Know, well, a laziest girl in town, yeah, I've claimed that before. <laughs> but um Parallels, I, Gilbert. G- 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 there, but the what? thing there are is parallels. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I know, that's why I said I should do the whole thing like this. I'm a I'm a Gottfried. But um I came I came out here to be a, an ink I, I came out here to work in cartoons. Yeah, well let's talk I, about I, that because we're both fascinated by your Hanna Barbera experience. Uh because yeah. I knew Bill and Joe. And that's, you did? Yeah, I was an animation writer well, for Bill's a time. Bill's dead. I, they're yeah, both, yeah. Go, they're you both were, gone. What, what do you mean you were in animation for I a wrote Saturday morning cartoons Do you think it was the Italian connection? Is that why we got the job? <laughs> no so. idea, Beverly, but I, yeah. I, 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 I had a, a shingle there for a while, and I got to know Bill and Joe. But what how, years? Oh, God, in the early 90s. Oh, wow. When they, when they weren't I'm speaking so to each other old. anymore. I, I I'm heard so they, old. I heard that Hanna-Barbera 
they were in the same building, Absolutely but true. they had two yes. separate floors. Yes. My, my last yes. day, I wanted a poster sign, and I had to come back yeah. two different days to get bills. I, I know. I got, I got a cell signed by um, uh, Joe and um, for a Penelope pit stop. Oh, I yeah, Wacky Racers. Things on wake, yeah. Wacky Racers. And, mm-hmm. and he was so old, he put, to the original Penelope pit stop. And I was like, well, okay, <laughs> you know, I'll take that. I just wanted the cell sign. How did you get there in the first place? Okay, it's fascinating. Well, well, here's I I don't know how fascinating it is. There's there's a little bit of nepotism involved as it as it turns out. Um, I was okay. If you really want to know how I got there, it starts with Grady Poe. Okay, because Grady Poe was my best friend, Ginny Poe's older brother. I fell in love with them, lost my virginity on the night of the junior senior prom because his parents were chaperoning, and uh, my parents figured that out. <laughs> And I was really young. And so the next thing you know, I'm going to school in Italy for the summer. Ah, convenient. And so I took uh, art courses at the American School in Florence. I know they just want... I mean, this is all retrospect, and they both... Sure. May they rest in peace, Priscilla and Jean. I know... I kind of know what they're doing, because now I have teenagers. But um, anyway, so I got a a portfolio there. I, I, I had an art portfolio, you know, and so I, when I was uh, my senior year, uh, instead of applying to colleges, I just uh, sent that portfolio to Hanna-Barbera and Disney, but I sent it to Hanna-Barbera because even though my dad had been a uh, musician, uh, you know, and kind of like a stay-at-home father before they invented that term, until I was about seven, he got into broadcasting, and by the time I was 17, I'm 17 when I graduated, by the time I was 17, he was vice president of Taft Broadcasting, and Taft Broadcasting purchased Hanna-Barbera. Nice. Now, Hanna Barbera paid a dollar twenty five an hour, and Disney paid a hundred an hour. What did you do specifically for them? I was a cell cleaner, then an inker and painter, and then I ventured into um, uh, backgrounds. But then I then I, I I was a hippie, and I was living on a commune, and it was seasonal work. So right. you'd 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 work for eight months, and then you're in the union, so you get pay. Well, you must know this. Do you remember this? Yeah, sure, sure. This was before. This was the Rotus, this is before computers. Yeah. This was 1969. Right, right. Okay. Um, so I had edged my way up to, you know, clouds of dust on the wacky races and stuff like that. But I didn't, uh, when that hiatus came, I uh, took to the road myself. And I wanted to be a singer, so I just sang all the way, all over the place. Right. And across that, Canada and back. And the, What did you call it? The, uh, the, 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 the commune circuit? The, uh... I, did, I did the commune circuit. <laughs> right. I had a square dance yeah. band right. and one. Right. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Tell I did Gilbert the about the, he circuit. wants to know about the topless bar with the with the women on the trapeze. Oh, it's fabulous. Yes. Okay, here's the deal. <laughs> so I was on. So I I was. So I I'm I know I'm long winded, but anyway, just just come to my show instead. But anyway, okay. Here's how. Here's here's what happened. So I I went. Well, actually, you know, I don't care. I'm going to tell you this. <laughs> on one of those on one of those communes, I got pregnant, and I was very young. And uh, this is just shortly after I was out of high school and had left California. And um, I had to go to New York and uh, to get this done. And I went, I had a friend in Mamaronac and she arranged it. So I drove down there with a bunch of hippies and had the thing done. And then my friend Jackie said, let's go into the city. And so she said, listen, there's this really great band that wants a singer. So that night... I went into this club on 113th Street and auditioned. They said, yeah, you're in. So that band was pretty cool, and we played an outdoor gig at Bard College, um, opening for Paul Butterfield Blues Band, and, and the, the speakers were from Woodstock. They were, the whole, they were gigantic, so wow. we're like, oh, let's plug into that. But the guitar player was wearing tennis shoes. We were on grass. He got electrocuted. It was a disaster. We <laughs> drive oh to a God. diner, <laughs> and they <laughs> said, Beverly, you know, you're too... And I thought it was funny. They didn't think it was funny. And they said, you know what? You're too green on stage and off. Bye-bye. At the same time, my friend Patches Eisenberg was taking off to go across the country to uh, British Columbia, where a couple of the mass marauders that had been busted with Ken Kesey had set up this fantastic commune. So we go all the way across the country, and it was just like we'd get like a letter from Owsley that was just a big pane of, just a big piece of window pane. It was crazy. We weren't allowed to tell the kids no there. That was one thing they were doing with the children there. But 
as all communal life goes, I'm getting to the topless bar, Gilbert. <laughs> as all as all communal as all communal life goes, you know, each person has to do what they can do, and I could sing, so I formed a square dance band, and and because uh, there were musicians there, you know, ding ding ding, and uh, I was in that square dance band when somebody from because the world was so transient in those years, everybody was hitchhiking, connected in some way, and it was like a subculture. I was part, I was in a, the subculture, mm-hmm. and so this guy wanted me to come to Toronto to sing back up on an album. So I go, yeah, to get on the train, and um, so now I'm in Toronto, and uh, I want a gig, and I'm ready to work anywhere. So in the newspaper, you could like you know, singer wanted, I'd get those gigs. I joined the musicians' union playing castanets because they would guarantee you a job like you could sing at New Year's Eve at the mental hospital or something. But my first real professional gig was at the fabulous Zanzibar. The Zanzibar was on Young Street and it was a, uh, I wouldn't say 24 hours, but I think it opened like around two in the afternoon and it closed at, well, it was Toronto the Goods, so it, it probably closed at midnight or maybe two in the morning. But anyway, and the best jazz players in town were there. And I wanted to sing with them because the thing about those drummers that have worked behind strippers is like you put your arm out like this and they go. Pachoo. So everything you do, they're just, they're used to backing strippers. And now I performed fully clothed, I might add, in a full length gown, very classy. And on either side of me were these giant oil uh, drums with the tops cut off, replaced with plexiglass that served kind of as like an uplight that illuminated, you know, their twats. And every, and every, it's true. Now the, every 20, every 40, that's not even funny. Oh my. But anyway, every 40 minutes, I would say, so I, I mean, it was like an eight hour gig or something. I think I sang from like two until 10 at night. It was like insane. Is that eight hours? Yeah. So, um, Every 40 minutes, I'd say, and now, gentlemen, it's swing time. And these trapezes would drop down. <laughs> and the, the gentleman sat in these raked, um, you know, like kind of, what do you call that? Raked seating, you know, when it yeah, goes up real yeah, steep. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was popcorn. They, they gave him popcorn. <laughs> and so the, like a movie. So the, so the trapezes <laughs> would drop down. The girls would get on in their, in their G-strings and swing, you know, for 20 minutes across these guys' heads. Like... You know, watching this stuff, and I'd sing the most extended version of "Girl from Ipanema" you can imagine. <laughs> I'd love to Everybody see that. Everybody would There'd be drum solos, and that "Girl from Ipanema" is like a samba, but we'd have a drum solo. You know, we have a guitar solo. But Ham, Ham, Ham and I, you know, we just. Um, but the real, the the real hot spot was down the street um, with Ronnie Hawkins. Ronnie Hawkins was enjoying. This is about seventy two. Ronnie Hawkins was enjoying a big flurry of fame. A big Ronnie rockabilly Hawkins, singer. Yeah, he was yeah, one of the original. Who rockabilly is. singers sure. who, who he's still around who, uh, yeah he is so yeah. but he had gone to canada where they'd never heard of rock and roll and that's where he found robbie and ricky and levon who would end up in coal miner's daughter thank you Beverly. yes what? Uh, yeah yes. yeah so anyway those guys had left him to go on the road with bob dylan they'd become the band but ronnie had a way of pinpointing great players and he could form bands so i heard they were looking for a singer I walked down after my gig at Zanzibar. I auditioned with like a, a Les McCann jazz tune, which is that's how I, I, I'm 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 in an evening gown <laughs> and I've walked into rockabilly heaven. But anyway, I sang this song and he said to me, "I swear to God, this happened." He said, "Stick with me, honey, and I'll have you farting through silk." And that's the God's honest truth. <laughs> so I entered into, even though rockabilly right. wasn't my thing, I entered into this very exciting world. Of like musicians really, really playing this roots music to tell you the truth, and it was a very fundamental part of me. So much so that when I did come to Hollywood, even though I'd been cast as a debutante, you know, in Hair, I think I just exuded so much of my kind of past experience and that kind of crunchy. That's interesting. You know, yeah. That it was all country and western stuff for me. People can of, see that. Roles. People can see you singing with the Hawkins with the uh, with Ronnie Hawkins. It's yes, on. It's can. on YouTube. Yes, there's, some, there's some clips of you singing crazy. Now, yeah. can I hear a little bit of you singing Girl for Me, Panima? <laughs> <clears throat> can you hear that? Yeah, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> Tall 
and tan and young and lovely, the girl from Ipanema goes walking, and when she passes, each one she passes goes, ah. <laughs> <laughs> When she sways, it's like a samba that do so do do and do 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 and I never learned the words to da 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 da. She doesn't see. Oh, anyway, it goes on. I never really learned the words. I don't lyrics think, by ever. Norman Gimbel. Charles yeah, Fox's old very right, kind old, of like, old partner. Really? Yeah. yeah, and tan and young and lovely. You know, I really tried to get that into it, but yeah, 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 yeah. That it's thank you for it's favoring us with that. Well, that's very kind of you. I, I wouldn't consider it my finest rendition, but you get the picture. Yeah. <laughs> you get a picture. You know what? Listen to this. Listen to this. This is true, too. One of the... So that was the, the thing, the trapeze. That was basically, you know, the gimmick. But, but uh, that and the popcorn. But one of the, one of the strippers... Well, they, they didn't strip. They just wore G-strings. They were dancers. They are topless dancers. Um uh, it was already off, but so one of them said to me, "You know, Ben, I've I, I've got a special yak. I can." And what she wanted to do was, "Is this too gross?" Well, you can cut it. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> what she wanted to do, she said that she, what the act that she wanted to do, she'd learned at, in Hawaii at a place called the Stoplight Club, and she could. What she wanted to do was gather <laughs> quarters from everybody in the audience. <laughs> Make a stack, kneel down, take it up into her, and then walk around and deposit them in the guy's hands. And she, she said to me, you think, you think I should tell the owner? And I said, why? What, you're trying to class up the joint? Like, what? Yeah, yeah. It was that kind of place. It was fantastic. The characters were fantastic. This is your kind she, of place, She Jill. could pick up quarters with her pussy? Yes. She could squat her. You know, I have children and I don't... But you know what? This is my story. This is... My, this, And I was doing that and listening to that while Meryl Streep was hearing... Now, when we approach Shakespeare, first we know that his words, the words themselves will take you where you need to go emotionally. I was hearing, you think I ought to introduce this as a class That's act? hilarious. You know, so so, yeah. so she wanted to pick up quarters with a pussy, one after yes. the other. Squat, and then, like, like, here are the quarters. <laughs> okay. Bever Beverly is acting this out. We're down not like that, and then keep them in, and then pop them out. <laughs> Oh Haven't you ever heard of that before? <laughs> Let's see her try that with Susan B. Anthony it, it, dollars. It, <laughs> are they going to do that? <laughs> they're, they're, that? Are they going to do the Susan B. Anthony dollars? No, I hope not. What and, about and the was, What about case. the Harriet Tubman bill? <laughs> I hope not. That's going to go over until 2028. I hope they do. in her chair, <laughs> lifted what? her leg up, and demonstrated. I was trying to show you. <laughs> By the way, Beverly, uh, about those days, did does you, this make me look bad? Not at all. No, okay. no, no. Okay, <laughs> well, you're <laughs> working with me. I, sure it's my bad. truth. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you did you bill yourself as Beverly Moses at one point? Were yes, you trying to pass I did. Yourself and off you as know a Jewish why? Singer? Yeah, you know why I did that. That's interesting. Talking about Gilbert, referring to I was I had stupidity on my side. <laughs> I got the bright idea that I could get more work if I had a Jewish name. <laughs> See, I, I just threw it. that in there for him because I it's knew he'd true. appreciate it. Yeah, so, it's true. so you went as far as Moses? Beverly Moses. That's, 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 that's what sprung to mind. You couldn't have just gone to Goldberg? Beverly yeah, Disraeli. Go no, way. Like Moses. I mean, how could you question Moses? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It didn't work, so I went back to D'Angelo. But I did, I did put an extra e in Beverly once because um, I, I, somebody told me that, that that the numbers of my name added up to a bad number, and I needed like another five or something. So for a while, I spelled it with an extra e. It did, nothing, you know, whatever. <laughs> I'm superstitious. I have another the, note here, Beverly. The benefit you, of stupidity. Were you Miss Ponderosa Steakhouse? Wouldn't you love a steak tonight? <laughs> Tender and juicy, tastes just right. A meal that'll satisfy your appetite. At Ponderosa, get a steak and sandwich, mashed pota and a salad, mashed potatoes too. You can get a square meal, square deal. Ponderosa. <laughs> oh, now you tell me if I happen? was Miss Ponderosa. 
I'm singing low. I'm resting my voice. Okay. <laughs> That's fantastic. So I guess the answer is yes. <laughs> yes. A resounding, a resounding yes. She was Beverly Moses and Miss Ponderosa. And Miss Ponderosa. Hey, I've got some claims to fame. That is versatility. You're not the only one, Gilbert. <laughs> Oh, by the way, wait a minute. Speaking of claims to fame, I don't know when you're airing this, but can we just have like a round of applause? Aladdin has like has has had the biggest opening in the history of electricity, practically. I mean, congratulations, Iago. No, but I'm He's not, not in, in this one. Oh, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, this part will cut out of the show. That's a good one. Oh, that's hilarious. Oh, that oh was God, so funny. I'm so sorry. Did I? I didn't mean. That's really the. Oh, that's, we can cut that. No, it's yeah. too good. We can cut that. I. I wanted. Oh gosh. I was. Oh, I'm. The oh. first one was a success too, Gil. Yeah. yeah, that's terrible to tell somebody. Hey, the movie you weren't in made a lot of money. Right. I, I'm. I didn't mean it like that. I was. I well, was you just could, trying to. You could make you it know. up to him by by telling him what yeah. you told us about Aflac before we turned on the. Uh, Please. Well, I'll tell you. Let me make it up to you because I'll tell you one thing. I wouldn't buy Aflac insurance if you <laughs> fucking paid me. <laughs> <laughs> God bless you, Molly. <laughs> I'll take it. God oh, bless you. God. That's hilarious. And the best thing about that commercial was you. That's what made it. It didn't exist. Who's going to, who in the world, who in the world would go, hmm, let's see, there's this insurance company and that insurance company. There's Aflac. There's a, nobody's even going to go with that insurance company. You know why they did? Because of you. Aflac. Because of you, right? Isn't that nice, Gil? Think? God bless you. No, but I, I think it's true. <laughs> no. And I, I think that these, you know, I I understand how stuff goes down. I do. I mean, I I get it. I know that 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 in, in when you're living in a country where you cannot exact any uh not demand any repercussions or consequences for an amoral president, it will leak out into other parts of the population. And you will find like that dog gnawing its paw people brought up on things that maybe if we had more moral order coming from our president we wouldn't pick on you know we we wouldn't look on it's like we have a desire we have a desire for a morality in this uh, code in this country but it's not being satisfied by our present president are you republican well, no, yeah, not. but but he he <laughs> was he wasn't president when I got fired. He's got no excuse. <laughs> uh, well, you got what? Yeah, yeah, the, it, was, oh, it was coming. Obama was. In I office. just had to get it in. I got just fired. had to get it in. Well, they were scared in advance. Speaking speaking of amorality, can we ask? No, you I'm quick- ruining everything now. The Aladdin. Now the, <laughs> I'm just trying to tell you how much I love you. <laughs> Speak, um, speaking of of uh, of amoral. Things. Can we ask you a little bit about the Sentinel, just for a laugh? Oh, the Sentinel. It turns out I won an award for it as the the. I think it was the funniest masturbation scene in cinema. <laughs> um, the, okay, here's how the Sentinel went. <laughs> So I, I started in this Broadway show that closed. Like I, I was doing, I was in this teeny repertory company in Canada, and really Gower Champion, who had directed Mame and sure everything, choreographed. Yeah, big big Broadway deal. It came to see the show, beckoned by Colleen Dewhurst, who had just uh, done Moon for the Mis- Eugene's Moon for the Misbegotten. She had a summer home on Prince Edward Island. She brought up her producer, who brought up Gower Champion, watched this charming little Canadian provincial, you know, rep company. Mm-hmm. You know, and this was one of the things you were doing the rock, the rock and, version of Hamlet. No, no, oh, it no. wasn't. Oh. It, it was, it was not so rocky. It was just musical. It was called Kronberg fifteen eighty two. Okay, and Gower said, "Fire everybody, but that girl." And boom, I opened on Broadway and they they totally redid it when they took it to New York they built the sets into the they were so confident they built the sets into the stage of the Minskoff Theater held 3,000 people they didn't even take it to Boston they figured well it's toured all the provinces in Canada anyway they added Meatloaf was a priest they made I, they made Hamlet black on purpose that was mm-hmm. a plot point and and uh, I sang for my uh, for Ophelia's death scene or suicide i strangled myself with a microphone cord and and died on stage good times okay yeah so it bombed right closed in a week 
closing a week. We previewed for three. I mean, for three weeks, I was getting standing ovations every time I'd strangle myself. And then it opens and it's like, you know, the minor version of show business. No Mm -hmm. business like show business. So I'm in, now I'm in New York. I really didn't have enough money to get back to Toronto. And I kind of, there was no, what am I going to go back to? Like, ding, ding, ding. Sure. So, um, so, but the movie's beckoned. And this director named Michael Winner, who everybody said, oh, he's a big deal. He did Death Wish. Yes. You know? And the cast, because there were so many casting directors and a lot of people like kind of uh, found me in this Broadway thing. It was evidently very legitimate, except it sucked. But I got a lot of attention. And um, so all the casting directors was, you know, reaching me and stuff. And so I went in to meet Michael Winner and he said, uh, oh, Beverly, he said, I, now I'm doing a film and I want you to take this script home. I'm offering you the part of Sandra. So I had a little apartment up in Spanish Harlem. I go up to my apartment. I read it. I don't have anything else to do. I read it. I go, huh. And I called the office back, called the casting director and I said, oh, it's Beverly D'Angelo. I need to come back in. I need to, I can be there in about 50 minutes. I need to talk to the director. And she was like, oh, this, this is highly unusual. I mean, you should call your agent and will arrange. I said, no, 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 no. I got to talk to him right now. I, it didn't occur to me that like there was all this machinery, right? She goes, well, just a minute. She said, Michael said to come down. And so I went down and I said, okay, look, I don't know if I want to be an actress, but if I wanted to be an actress, I don't know if this is how I would start. I said, look at this on, on, on page 50, I, on page 30 I'm I'm eating the brains out of a guy's head <laughs> yes. and and he said he said oh but my dear you'll be eating the brains out of Chris Sarandon's head and he's just been nominated for an Oscar and I went oh okay but look 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 over here I I I, I, I I'm 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 a deaf mute lesbian <laughs> with a <laughs> masturbation scene and I'm I'm part of a couple. He said, oh, yes, my dear, your your partner is Sylvia Miles, and she's been nominated twice. So I thought, well, okay, you know, I guess in the movies, you know, Oscars mean something. Sure. He's a big deal, so sign me up, and uh, so I did it. I've never seen a larger crew in my life than when I, <laughs> I when I did that thing, and I've seen it because on YouTube, there's a hilarious thing that I'm going to steal and show in my multimedia show. I'm okay. stealing it, just telling you. It's called The Dykes Downstairs, <laughs> and they've they've taken the scene, and they've put a laugh. They, well, you can see people are watching it and laughing, at, and it's, it's really hilarious in retrospect. It's just ridiculous, and even the masturbation part was ridiculous, it's because because I didn't have any qualms about it personally. I figured I I masturbate. What what's the big deal? You know. I mean, I just whatever. Nobody was saying Beverly, don't do that. I mean, I I don't I didn't know those people, and um, but when I look at it, I was a bit rambunctious. I, I did kind of overdo it. I mean, that's you know, I was like, Wah! you know, well, it's like some the moment of you topless playing the cymbals. Oh yeah, that was a good one. Really stays with you. And, and you were there with Burgess. Oh, because Meredith. I was a zombie. You I wasn't a, just a mute right. lesbian. I was also a yes, zombie. A zombie mute lesbian. Yeah. Did you oh. have to be careful with the symbols? <laughs> <laughs> no. I just put my arms out. What it is about okay. what about those actors? Eli Wallach and 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 what uh, about oh uh, God, John Ava Carradine, Gardner, Ava Gardner, Ava Gardner, Ava Gardner uh, Burgess Meredith, yeah. John Carradine, Martin Balsam, uh, Can- the the guy who was in, Arthur Kennedy, who was Arthur in, Kennedy. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, it would have been like if we cast me in a movie now. I mean, you you know what I mean? It's like all the all the greats from another era, and and uh, I when I I. They everything took place. Everything that I did took place in this. Uh, I think they'd taken over a brownstone in uh, in in Brooklyn. I think Brooklyn Heights or something. And the first floor of the brownstone was designated for costumes, and I had to go in for costumes, which was basically like a leotard and some wisps of chiffon for the symbol act. <laughs> how to make you know so i go in and lo and behold in walks the majestic the beautiful the perfection the woman i watched every afternoon in black and white as a little kid on harwich road in columbus ohio ava gardner and she came in she's smoking a cigarette she had on a pink chanel suit and she sat down kind of like this she said where is everybody and i said i don't know i'm i'm, I'm waiting for them too we were surrounded by racks and uh and she said, what are you doing in this? And I said, I'm playing Sandra. And she went, oh, 
Yeah. And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm playing the lesbian. And, and I said, look, I got to tell you something. I don't know if I even want to be an actress, but if I did, you know, Ava, I think I called her, you know, what, <laughs> what would your advice be? And she went, keep the clothes. And it turned out that when I, and then, then I devoured all these biographies about her and autobiographies, and that was always in her contract. How about that? Like every article of clothing you know, that was designed for her belonged to her, and that was her thing. So that was her acting advice, keep the clothes. Good advice. And didn't Good that, advice. that movie, I think, got in trouble? Yes, because, it did. Yeah. Two, two reasons. Well, one of them, they use actual handicapped people uh, oh, as not the just creatures from hell. They not just they they didn't they weren't just handicapped people. It wasn't like let's give an opportunity to people with abnormalities. These were institutionalized people. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, these were people that were institutionalized and were taken from an institution and carted there. And there were burn victims. There was a guy that you know they called Harry the Lip. It was terrible. He had a lip that came down to here. You know they had inoperable things, but also you know th other other things about their being that required institutionalization. And there was a big thing. SAG did that, but there was another thing that happened too, and it had to do with the masturbation scene. And what happened was, when they released the film, now you know how films go, the producers make it, the studio in that case makes it, and then there's a distribution process. And the, the various distributors use various theaters, and then they're the theater owners, right? You know about that, right? Yes, you sure, goes. sure. Okay, so anyway, but by the time it gets down to the theater owners, they're just accepting the opportunity to, to show the film. They get most of their money from the first couple of weeks. But anyway, what happened was, I think it was Utah. It could have been Colorado. But what happened was a um, a couple of theater owners uh, cut the masturbation scene. And uh, so there was legislation passed that any actor who was in a film could only be cut by the, you know, the the director or the studio, whoever had the cut, that theater owners could not, they either had to take the film in its entirety or not. And so it was a little, so I think I kind of won one for our side in that. Wow. Because actors can't be, you can't, a, a theater owner can't cut out a performance. That's interesting. Did you have good, do you have good parents? Did you, are they with you now? Are they still around your parents? Oh, uh, no. But were they, did you have a good Child. Yeah, yeah. I I had good parents too. I I, I grew. My parents loved each other. I kind of grew up witnessing a you know a wonderful love affair, and it was in the Midwest. And and those core values, you know, they they really socked them in there. And and I I really more and more, you know, I I'm so grateful for the parents that I had. I didn't have whack jobs at all. We just well, my mother joined the circus once, though. Your, your mother joined the circus. <laughs> yeah, she did. I was reading she about did. your parents too. Your dad was a local yeah. celebrity in in yeah. Ohio. Yeah, it sounds was. like a real character. He was a musician who worked uh, with big bands. He and just passed away. I know, yeah, I know. I'm sorry. Greatest. Our condolences. He was the greatest. Gino the Giant yeah, Killer. Yeah. Called yeah. everybody babe, I read. Called everybody babe. Yeah. He, he built a replica of the Santa Maria and floated it in yes, the Sayota River. Yes, I was River. telling Gilbert that <laughs> yeah, story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Talent, a talented he went family far. all around, Beverly. Very talented. My, my mother was a... A uh, she got a full four year uh, scholarship to Smith College as yeah. a violinist, and then she ran away to Sarasota and joined the circus. Very impressive. Yeah, she came, they brought her back though, and Shocked they her brought bit. her back. Do you they remember did. working with some of these great old character like, like Martin who? Balsam? Well, I mean, I remembered meeting him, but I, I you have to understand that when I entered into film, it was kind of on my way, I thought, to being a singer. It's just a stepping stone for you. Yeah. It wasn't a stepping stone. It was an opportunity. It was like another opportunity to express myself, because that's what I was going to say to you, is that, you know, I started out thinking, well, commercial art, mm -hmm. and then I discovered I could sing, and that right. when I sang, it changed the molecules around me and the way that the atmosphere was, and it felt good, and I could express express myself through it and then that led me to you know singing and dancing on broadway and that led me to films even though you know it's the sentinel but you know it's just well, kind of, but I, then, I just but then always, musical films yeah yeah but, but, but and then the musical films right? yeah hair and cool yeah. daughter but it's to me life has always been and continues to be just kind of like an expanding thing and you just look where it can be when i i had my kids very late i got pregnant when i was 48 you know nice date but anyway i got <laughs> I, I got 
<laughs> Surprise! It didn't happen like that. We used all kinds of science, Al and I. But the but the point is that for me, motherhood was was not a casual thing, and I saw that as an opportunity to expand myself too in uh-huh. in, in in expression. And this had to do with you know being a, a parent and a teacher. And I I did I pulled back from movies. You know, I think it's interesting. You say it's a sort of a, a philosophy of life. You know, a door opens and and you walk through it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. That's that's the way. What hair, else are you gonna do? Well, that's <laughs> right. what are you gonna do? And when you're talking about Gilbert was talking about <laughs> the how curtain is closed. Gilbert was saying about uh, talking about being too stupid to know the difference or to but know what, any yeah, better when he started his career. That? What what were you too stupid because, about? Because that's yeah. Well, it it's one of these things where, well, first of all, I went into it not thinking the odds. Against, but you were like ambition. fifteen. Yes, yeah. he was when you started doing stand up. Yeah. Right? What got into your mind to? I I think I'll go do stand up tonight. Yeah. What, what was that? Well, it it's for a while. I was just kind of joking around, thinking I wanted to be in the business. And in my, but was there some person that you said I want to emulate that, or did you make it up in your mind oh, too? There were a million people I'd watch yeah. on TV and in movies. Jack Parr. Uh, well, not. No. I didn't want to be Jack Parr. <laughs> <laughs> You're Jack Parr now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and the funny thing, but now when people say to me, "Oh, I'm an aspiring comic or actor," or yeah. when they say, "How would you feel about your kids doing it?" I think, you know, now I think realistically, like the yeah. odds are ridiculous. The odds are off the charts. Yeah. The odds are ridiculous. Like, how did that happen? You're right. And and I think, like, uh, I can only imagine what my parents thought back then because it's like, he was here I was, this kid failing in school, uh-huh. and and it was like so, but I did they, did they Did they recognize that you'd found your spark, or was it just so foreign I, to them what you were I, doing? I think it was foreign to them, and I think, now it scares me to think back on it. Where I or think, or does like, it make you feel so grateful that they under that that even even though they didn't understand it, they didn't like say you can never leave the house or anything like that. Yeah, or they never punitive. did that. Yeah, well, that's but, pretty cool. Yeah, but it's I think of it now, and I think like I could un- like if my kids said they wanted to be in show business. Right. I would think like I understand reaching yeah. into a trash can, taking out <laughs> bottles and yeah. turning it in for a 5 cent deposit. Right. That at least is logical. <laughs> right. So I kept I went into the business like an idiot and I kept doing it like an idiot. Uh, Not thinking But you the- did it because you loved it, right? Yeah. Do you remember that one moment when you were standing on a stage and it all went fuck and kind of carved a neural pathway in your brain that made you want to get that again and again and again? Oh, I would remember that, but then it would be followed by the next night where yeah. you bomb like uh, <laughs> I, it's the t- it's like I mean, isn't the stand-up comedian like the boxer of sports? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just oh, it's that's a, a one. That's on, an interesting analogy. It's 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 one on one. You know. Yeah, so I would always, uh, I would do great and think, oh, that's it. I'm a star now. Right. And then right. the next night, I'd bomb like no one else With did the same jokes? Life. Yeah, yeah. And so what did that teach you? Did you, did you, did, did you learn uh, to read the audience more or timing or how did you get around I, I that? I guess years and years later, but still, you're up there not knowing what's going to happen. Isn't is that exciting? Do you like that? I it dep- I'm I'm excited when the show's over and they give me the check. <laughs> <laughs> <to> the check. <laughs> well, Beverly, you said I saw an interview with you and you were saying that specifically one of the times where you said you were too stupid to realize what you were taking on was taking on Patsy Cline. Was, was oh, that was just blind. Yeah, I can do that. That was just blind. I can do that. It didn't occur to me that there was. It just, it, it was like, I, I met the casting director. I told him my background. I said, I've been singing these Patsy Cline songs forever. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
uh, so I knew who she was, but you got to remember when we made Coal Miner's Daughter, people didn't really know who Patsy Cline was. Singers knew who she was. Yeah, that's Musicians knew, but she was not popular and none of her records were in release. She wasn't, you know, it was just, it was, she was a, if anybody knew about her, it's because Loretta Lynn say, said, this is my mentor, but she had a very brief career. Yes. Very brief career. She stopped uh, 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 when she had kids and then she started and then she died. You know, I mean, it was very brief. By the way, I'm the docent of the Patsy Cline uh, Museum. Yes, in, uh, I'd heard the, that. The video docent in, in Nashville. Very cool. Yeah. But but the the point is that it didn't occur to me that I was 5'3 and she was 5'9 and she had black hair and she was big, you know, it just, that didn't occur to me. And what I did was, instead of doing a screen test, uh, Owen Bradley, who did the uh, sound, who, who, who recorded Patsy Cline and Loretta Lynn originally, uh, produced the soundtrack, the mm-hmm. re-record. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he sent um, some tracks of, uh, so, uh, I think it was Sweet Dreams or I Fall to Peace, something like that, minus her voice, and I sang on that. That's great, and and uh, so that's how I got it. If if I would have had any inkling that it was being vied for, or that if I if I would have had the ability to look at me through anybody else's eyes, I probably would have said, "Oh, I'll never get that." But it it just didn't occur to me. And the then courage knew, of youth. It, the courage of youth, and and also you know the the casting director, his name was Michael Chinich. You know he was very inter- he was a big fan of Ronnie, and he was a big fan of Levon Helm too, mm-hmm. who's my friend from from back in the day. And so Levon got cast too. So it was, it was very, uh, and and also the director Michael Apted, he was coming from a documentary oh, yeah. background. Sure. So he just kind of created an atmosphere, and we were just who we were. I think to tell the truth, more than anything, because I I was so broke, I didn't have any access to, to you know archival stuff except the music. So I, I would listen to her sing and get everything I needed to know. I felt at that time, like for example, so I had Owen separate the track and, and there was a song, um, she was singing, uh, Oh, Oh, crazy. And, um, so I'm listening to the track and the very last, and I'm crazy for loving you. Well, on the track, she take, when she comes to that part at the end, she goes, loving you like that and i said what's that weird breath in there and he i said was she crying and owen said no she'd gotten in a car accident her face was all banged up and her ribs were broken and when she took that big breath it hurt how about that so that led me on the trail well tell me about the car accident tell me about the thing what about this so i i kind of approached that all through the singing which is what i could could really understand i could hear the way she breathed i could hear the way that she attacks certain words and that can tell you so much about who a person is you mm-hmm. know when you when you hear them up close with no other music singing so that was that was uh i got way off the subject probably right? no it's i, I, I just yeah. want to recommend to our listeners that they get the coal miner's daughter soundtrack because your 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 tracks are, your tracks are on there vinyl. well the ones the ones that didn't end up in the movie the ones that got cut, yeah, oh yeah, that's uh, cut, true. They can listen to. And yeah, we did. We shot a scene with Walking After Midnight, but it got cut. It's on YouTube. People a lot can of stuff find got it. Cut. Yeah, they're worth hearing. Mm. Thank you. Good Thank movie you. too. Just watch it again, by the way. And just and who knew Leon Helm could act? Wasn't he? I mean, great? I love the band. He made it. He made another movie too. Uh, uh, the Dollhouse. Right. Right. With, uh, but oh, no, it wasn't called Dollhouse. Dollmaker. Dollmaker. It, it was good. Yeah. Great documentary. Good about film him, all around. So. Yeah, good film. Good yeah. film holds up. Yeah. Tell us, too, this is Gilbert will enjoy this. <laughs> you will? Where is my card? You were going to tell us before. Uh, we Frank, you are so thorough. I'm so grateful and impressed. <laughs> oh, it's just. I really am. Oh, it's just stuff I do, Beverly. Okay. I've got my own pathology. <laughs> Ooh. Tell, tell us about me. screen testing for Raging Bull. I want to know about your pathology. Oh, it's a whole other show. Oh, okay. So what happened with Raging Bull was. Uh, I was up for that. I remember going to an apartment to meet Marty and uh, Robert De Niro, and we improvised a little bit. Oh, it was the same casting director who did The Sentinel. I'm not kidding you. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so uh, I was really interested in that. and uh, You would have been cast as an Italian, as we said in the intro. You never get any Italian Well, she was Irish. 
Oh, Vicky. Was like, the character was Vicky, Vicky was Irish. That's Vicky right. Was Irish. That's right. But anyway, but I, you know, anyway. So uh, what happened was it was going kind of well, and they wanted me to screen test, and uh, it came down to me and one other person, and I got offered Coal Miner's Daughter. And I said to my agent, no, I, I want to go for this. And so when you do a screen test, you have to sign a contract. And this particular contract said that if I got the role, I wouldn't be allowed to appear in any other movie until this was released. I see. And it was going to take a year to shoot because he, because uh, De Niro had to do the weight gain and right. the loss and all that right. kind of stuff. So I was ready to do that. And I said, no, 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 no. I want to do the screen test. T tell him goodbye. I'm not, I'm not going to do Coal Miner's Daughter. Right? And so I went to do the screen test in the morning and put on the little 40 stuff. And we did this one scene. I improvised a line. I, my, the line I improvised was, uh, I sucked your brother's cock. I, I just did. It, 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 it stayed in the movie. But anyway, it was a fight scene between the two of them. And then, um, then Kathy, who, by the way, is a good friend of mine, um, then they did Kathy. It was over. Everything was over by about 10 in the morning. And the next morning, Marty called me and he said, listen, Beverly, if we were going to go with an actress, we'd go with you. But we put Kathy on film. We didn't know what would happen if we filmed her. And she just is this role. And I said, great. Picked up the phone and I called my agent. I said, you know how I, I said I didn't want to do it yesterday? I, I Can you get it back? The call <laughs> Good thing. timing. And he said, I never told him. No. Oh. So I took off and went to Nashville and I had, it was wonderful. That was wonderful. It was meant to be. Yeah, it's good. It's to totally great the to way be. it worked out. Yeah. Where yeah, I was going to go really with great. Gilbert because he has a monkey obsession. Yes. I wanted oh, to ask about working, which, working oh with Clyde God, in every which way oh, but loose. Oh, oh, oh. And, and you okay. know something? I think, like, I mean, I worked with these, uh, this act. The Bur these, Berlusconi brothers? It or might no? be. They Brisconi, were uh, three orangutans. You worked yes. with orangutans? Yes. Yeah, I, yes. yes. And it was the brisk. We got to look this up because they got arrested and, and, and everything. And, and this was on <laughs> thick of the night. Okay. Then, Brisconi or something like that. Then a year after I'm off of thick of the night, I auditioned for a show called Mr. Smith. Yeah. Which I think were the same oh. orangutans. Wow. Probably. And I think those are the orangutans that are in any which way but loose. Every which way but loose. Yes, probably. It's the. It was the. I'll tell you something about that. They then got, they then got arrested for animal cruelty. Oh years God! Later because they they ended up doing an act in Vegas, and I know why because this is the truth of what happened. It's terrible. Should I tell you this too? Yes. Well, okay. <laughs> if it's but, terrible, but, but we'll you, cut but, it out. But you have, but you have, you said, I want to just establish this first. You have a monkey obsession or you just, your past is tied up with monkey. Uh, that, uh, yes. All right. Tell her the chimp. And, and tell was, her your chimp theory from What's Sunset chimp Boulevard. Theory? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, right. He started at uh, the dead chimp. Well, according to his funeral in, in, in Sunset I'm Boulevard. I'm ready for my close up now. What? In Sunset Boulevard, there's a funeral. For her, right, for her chimp. chimp. Yes. Exactly. And the story that I heard is uh, Billy Wilder said to her, uh, okay, now to remember, the chimp is your lover. You're fucking the chimp, uh, Ooh, Billy Wilder whoa. said to her. And the, the, the story I heard, and I talked to Jackie So then the my stories man. are nothing compared to that. <laughs> okay. Oh, they're yours are plenty and, good. They deal about we, the quarters. We talked about this, and there's a theory that back then, rich women would uh, hire, ch would buy chimpanzees. And who fuck are them? No, no, who were trained to perform cunnilingus. Really? With their giant mouths and tongues. <laughs> yeah, because, uh, you know, if you look scientifically, chimps do have a very small uh, penis. That's that's a fact. Yeah. But, so, okay. So, but, so these where did you get? Chimps, wait, wait. These, where, what's the origin of that? What's the origin of the cunnilingus? Gilbert dreamt it. Chimps. No, I, well, you, yeah, really. I, I mean, Billy Wilder did say, "Remember, you're fucking the chimp." Okay, but that's that's not cunnilingus. Yeah. Well, he meant. You, I guess he meant you minute, had a that's relationship. That's an interesting with point. Chimp. Is so is the word "fucking" for you like a catch-all for just maybe sex? or maybe. maybe the, 
chimpanzees are considerate, and they like to warm the woman up first with cunnilingus. Oh, 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 like 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 a stunt. Uh, what do you call a fluffer? A fluffer. They're the fluffer. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The, the orangutan um, I've never was named heard that, but I, I'm still missing the link here. I well, know what <laughs> Billy Wilder said, but where did you hear this rumor about the... Well, me and, and of course, Jackie the jo- <laughs> Joker Man <laughs> Martin. Oh, Jackie the Joker. You guys made it up. Yeah. No, no. This is this is a popular it's, it's, belief. It's out there, I'm Beverly. Google, it's I've out got there. my it, iPad. It may I'm be, an, it may be an urban myth, but it's floating around It's an out urban there. myth. Yeah. And, okay. and, you know, when I'm on a movie set... To yeah. keep my heart on, they he bring a female <laughs> chimp. He insists they really on a me. It's in his rider. Well, I didn't. I didn't know you would. Uh, you were now in porn. You've done. You've done so much. Yes. in your career. It's you have a chimp. You have a chimp rider. Uh, yeah, a chimp rider. Well, what, ha- what happened? And and, and <laughs> the music. My story. Will sound, this is not. Uh, my story cannot follow this. Filth and that and the music into. that's played. While a chimp is eating oh, a rich woman's is, pussy. Tall and tan and young and lovely, <laughs> the girl from me, Benin, right? Is that what you're well, going to say? Well, that's, that's good. That's certainly, <laughs> but there's another one. We'll put it in after. Okay. Yeah. After I know, I know oh, what you're thinking. By the way, do you know that I, I my son, I got I to gotta say this, my son is so excited about this. He sends me stuff of yours all the time, and and he knows that I'm like, I'm, I'm Rocky going to sleep. You know what I mean? It takes me about an hour, but I really try. I set my alarms and everything to get my eight hours and blah, blah, blah. And he sent me your meditation. Oh my God! Yes, I did that for the comedy show. It's channel. the greatest. It's the greatest <laughs> in the world. Uh, the absolute greatest. Yeah, the meditation yeah. tape yeah, on the yeah, comedy a, channel. Which, yeah, the, calm down. You know, relax. You know, it's just it's brilliant. It's really brilliant. So maybe you should make maybe you should make one of those you like should. seduction tapes, like how to speak to your lover. Roll on her. You know. <laughs> Have you seen his Fifty Shades of Grey narration, Beverly? I no, I haven't, and we'll, we'll I, I didn't do my homework as much. That's as That's okay. You have. We'll send I'm that to sorry. you. I know it's there. I'm, I'm ready for it. That's we're going to move off the orangutan. Tell us, okay. the, Tell us about. Uh, you were starting to tell us before we, we put the mics on about Big Trouble, and our friend Andrew Bergman. <gasps> oh you my interviewed God. Andy Bergman. Yes. Did we, he talk about it? Uh, briefly. Did he say anything about we, it? Briefly. We love Andrew. Well, I I, I remember. Love too. Good guy. I once worked with Alan Arkin. Who and we he, love. Yeah, he's, he's oh, a real terrific, actor. Terrific, terrific. Yeah, yeah. And he was talking about Into making... Into reincarnation when I worked with him. Oh, interesting. He would look at me and say, does Russia mean anything to you? But go ahead. He <laughs> he was talking about making big trouble. Yeah, what did he say? He said, oh, of working with... We should uh, really do a documentary about it. Cassavetes as yeah, a yeah, director, yeah. Yeah. he said it was like... The Marx Brothers being directed by Beta Lugosi. Okay, I gotta tell you something. <laughs> I, I, I've also heard that John Cassavetti says that it was a, referred to it as John Cassavetti's referred to it as the aptly named Big Trouble. Uh, part of the the I'll get rid of the tragic stuff first, but when he turned in his cut, they said to him, this is way too long. It's a comedy. It's got to come in at 90 minutes. And he said, over my dead body, he had cirrhosis. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it wasn't his cut. It wasn't his cut. But here's what happened. And this is my point of view. I love Andy Bergman. And when I, and that was, uh, it wasn't exactly an audition, but that was a, a meeting, a chemistry meeting with me and Andy and, and Peter Falk and the producer, Mike Lobel and Alan Arkin and Alan Arkin said, I can see you with these guys like that's, it's going to work. I was very excited about it. It was, um, it was a parody. It was, as Andrew wrote it, it was a parody of Double Indemnity. Mm-hmm. My character's name is Blanche Ricky. Um, anyway, so it's like kind of an up, yeah, yeah, yeah good, good joke. Tricky. So, um, Andrew had written a script, uh, that was, you know, the earmarks of double indemnity and that, you know, innocent Alan Arkin is pulled into an insurance scam and he's hoodwinked and blah, blah, blah. So anyway, um, we had rehearsals uh, where the sets were taped off and we ran some stuff and that we did that for a couple of weeks. And then we went to shoot. And this is what I remember, that the first night we shot, 
it was a night shoot and we were on a bridge and uh, this particular scene was post-kidnapping Charles Durning and we're fighting in the back seat. Alan Arkin, me, and, 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 and Peter, Peter's in the driver's seat or something, but there's a fight going on and Peter stops the car and he goes, that's it. And he gets out of the car and he goes, everything's my fault. That crack in the road, that's my fault. And then... And I think, and and Alan Arkin gets out going another way. Anyway, I'd have I I I've never seen the movie, but I'd have to watch it. Anyway, the point is that uh oh, wait a minute, I'm telling the wrong story. Can we go back? <laughs> yeah, we can go oh, back. Wait, oh, wait, can we go back? I was going to tell the story about how the director quit. How that's, Andrew quit. That's fine. Yeah, tell that but, one. We'll 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 trim all this. Okay, okay. It's not okay. live. So, so what happened was, so I get the thing, and I was living in Italy at the time, so I rent a house, and um, I'm all down for it. It's all great. Costumes are going to be great, fantastic, uh, turbans, fabulous clothes. And the um, script was funny. It was all good. And Alan Arkin and Peter Falk are great. They're just great. So we're doing these rehearsals, and then I don't even think we'd shot anything. Except this scene that I'm telling you about. I am telling the right story. Okay. I'm telling the right story. <laughs> okay. Thank God. Okay, good. So we're shooting this. Thank God. <laughs> so we're shooting this scene. It was at night. And what was happening was Peter Falk would do it differently every time. Different to the to the extent of the window would be rolled up or rolled down. And he'd go in the car door one way or and get back, climb back into the window or open up the car door and turn around. And, you know, matching was very important in the days of, of uh, 35 millimeter film, A, because it was expensive. So, you know, when they said action, you had a finite amount of time to get it done. And they traditionally cut on the move. So you would stop and start a take with like a move, like you move into it. And so if if you have got your coverage and you open up the door, chances are you'd start the next take on the door opening. Anyway, Peter kept doing things differently and changing things and saying different lines, and it was and Alan wasn't happy about it. And so Alan said something to somebody. And the next thing you know, I'm looking over here and I I see I see the wardrobe man getting like shaken like that. It's something had happened. Alan would have to tell you what happened. I don't know, but I know that he wasn't happy about about Peter not matching. The next day, I got a letter that said, "Dear Beverly, I've talked this over with my wife, and I've decided that I'm not going to continue on on this film. It's been wonderful. Thank you for understanding." Andrew Bergman. I got a call then from the producer, Michael Bell, who said, look, here's the thing. We're just going to be down for, uh, you know, a couple of weeks, just a couple of weeks. I think Howard Deutsch is going to direct it, but, you know, we're going to, don't leave. It's, it's still all happening and all that kind of stuff. Four days later, I'm called back to set and now John Cassavetes is directing it. And I'm in the makeup trailer and John comes in and there's just, to know that guy is is to love him and it's just it, it it falls off of him so he walks in and and he says you see this and, I went, and he goes and he throws the script out oh, he throws no. the script out. yeah oh, no. so so the set was we had two continuity women one who had the there, there were four scripts at any given time the original script the rewrites the days, the, the 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 revisions for that particular scene for the day, and then we had one woman who just wrote down what we actually shot. Oh boy! Because it was all. And John said that famous line, "Matching is for sissies," which it is now that there's digital. But you know, there were so many gifts on that movie. I I I I remember, I remember uh, Peter. Because I did say to him, like, what, what, what did you do to make Alan so mad? I mean, what's happening and everything? And he said, listen, he said, it's all okay. And he said, every person has to do what they need to do to make that their set. You know, and, it, and it's true. I've, oh. I've seen it again and again. It's kind of tied into maybe even Chevy a little bit. But, you know, everybody has a different way of working there. I've, I've worked with an actress who who just eviscerated everybody. And she would just say, I remember being in her trailer once and the director knocked on the door. She said, whatever you want, the answer is no. Which she, brilliant actress, but she had to do that. 
Because unless she took everybody down to a certain level of like being beaten up or or treated badly, she didn't feel strong enough. And everybody has a different way of approaching that, creating that space that you need to really be like... That's fascinating. You know, creative and, 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 and to do your thing. And it doesn't happen all the time. And it's, it gets harder and harder as the, the concept of acting becomes more and more, um, you know, uh, corporate. Mm-hmm. Gilbert, corporate. are you that diva on yeah. your film sets? Oh, yes. Are you the one that won't come out of your trailer and... Yeah, not unless so I. So you're not. You can't do that anymore. Unless I have my own anymore. personal hairdresser and chimp. Yes, and chimp <laughs> and my, chimp. A chimp. Unless whopper. you have your chimp, your chimp writer. <laughs> unless I have a cunnilingus chimp, a trained oh my God. cunnilingus chimp. Beverly, can we ask you about <laughs> yeah. some of the other uh, famous people, uh, icons that you worked? Sure. With? Uh, we're just throwing this out here. Uh, Eddie Bracken. In the la- that wonderful, oh my God, that wonderful the sweetest man in the world. Of, okay, of vacation. so the original ending of the first vacation, National Poon's vacation, ended with Eddie Bracken, famous song and dance man. But sure. it ended with we get to Wally World, it's closed. So we go to uh, Wally's house and we hold up um, uh, Eddie Bracken and, and make him perform for us at gunpoint. And he did a song and dance with Tom. What's his name? Anyway, he does a song and dance, and it was great. It was a, he was a song and dance man. But at gunpoint. So then um, I get called back from Italy because we're reshooting the ending and we're back at Magic Mountain and we're getting on a uh, uh, the roller coaster. And I look at it was for, for a rehearsal and, and Eddie had on a tie with all of his grandchildren's name on it. You're like, Bobby, oh. Betty, oh, that's Sue, sweet. You know, so sweet. And uh, uh, and I, I said to Maddie, hey, what's the deal? Why, why, why are we changing the ending? And Maddie Simmons always smoked a cigar that was kind of attached to his lips by these just a couple of strings of saliva, you know, that kind of, <laughs> and you and I was always fascinated, like how far is he going to take it out of his mouth? Are the strings going to break or stay intact? So he goes to the thing. He said, well, he said the first ending was, you know, we tested it, and it's a uh, it's a bit too tasteful. And I looked at Eddie, and he, he was just like, you could tell he was crestfallen because he he wasn't going to get the song and oh, dance because it, it was that. too tasteful. Yeah. It was too much of a golden moment, evidently, because he was so great. But this, what a Well, this sweet was, the, if you watch the, do, the documentary about the making of the movie, I mean, the first Oh, ending, I didn't see the documentary. Well, they, they pre, well, you're was in I in it. it? Yeah, you're in it. They, oh, pre, they previewed it, it, and the audience didn't like the original ending, and that's when Harold. I know, but Harold, it was Eddie singing and dancing. Right, right. And right. what about working with Woody Allen? Yeah, you went in and you told him that you'd had a dream about him with Bob yes, Dylan. Yes, here's what happened. Again, this was on the overflow of the of the Broadway show. And um, uh, Marion Doherty called me in to meet him. And I had, uh, I had, I, I, I have kept diaries since I was maybe 15 and I, still have them but um i kept a diary at that time and um i had had a dream about him so i took my diary in and i said this you know i i, I had a dream about you and he goes oh i said i brought my diary and so i read it to him and the dream was that we were at a party and i went outside in the snow and bob dylan was there and woody allen came out and he was playing the tuba so i read him that dream <laughs> and he said and he said, um, uh, you know, I'm making this movie. Can can you be in it? And and uh, I'm going to shoot. It was like either tomorrow or the day after tomorrow or something. And I said, yeah, great. Um, and uh, But I, I wasn't in SAG. And he said, you know, well, we'll, we'll do the thing, whatever you have to do. Because I'd already done the deaf mute lesbian. So I think there's something taft. Whatever it was, I needed to have a card to be in this movie. So got the card. And... Uh, I went to shoot with him, and we, we spent the whole day. We shot a little bit, and then we went out to lunch, and then we went back and shot. And it was a scene, uh, from my point of view, it was a scene, he shot it on video. And this mm-hmm. was 76 or 70, I think it came out, whatever it was. Came it out was in like, 77. What's well, video, yeah. you know, I mean, right. it's like this great big thing. And um, I uh, played the wife of a guy, who ended up being coal miner's daughter, by the way, um, a wife of a guy on a sitcom. And in the film, when Woody Allen comes out to uh, California and Tony Roberts sure. has gone all Hollywood. The laugh he, track. 
he takes them and they're putting yeah. on. That's me saying, right. you know, my cousin, the Neanderthal man, ha, or something like that. But the thing that happened was I knew nothing about film. In fact, I remember going to meet him and free. I was so cold that I actually did this really cool thing where I cut these really colorful socks off and like wrapped them around my knees so they were like up to my thigh over my boots. It was a cool look. But I mean, I was free. I didn't even have <laughs> money to buy clothes. So I was making them up. So anyway, um, uh, I then thought, well, I spent the whole day filming and a movie's only two hours long. So uh, stupidity. Um, so from then on, I, I said to everybody, oh, I'm, I'm in the Woody Allen film. And, you know, he always kept people so um, like in awe and so quiet about, you know, like everything was under wraps. I didn't even, I think I was told that the name of the project was Anhedonia. Yeah, that was the original t- working oh, title. But but anyway, I, I didn't even get a script. I mean, it was just like pages and it was all super secret. So in other words, when I would say to the people, oh, yeah, I just uh, shot the Woody Allen movie or whatever you know they go they thought i was starring in it because i for all i knew <laughs> yeah. you, you I knew, shot me for eight hours nine uh-huh. hours of course, i mean gonna cut it down there'd be two hours of me you know you I thought had no you, idea you thought you were the star but i think oh, I, I i i didn't know what else to think right right what about peter o'toole and making high spirits peter o'toole <laughs> peter o'toole was was peter o'toole i mean he was very he was magnificent um, I don't know how happy he was, you know, <laughs> during the filming, <laughs> but he also had, uh, he was on a, pro- and I, you know, I worked with Richard Harris and Richard Harris did the same thing. There was some program going on where like you, 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 you would stop drinking, but you always had to have a bottle in the room with oh, you. That's interesting. It was it was a method. I think they just did it in England. I don't know, but um, I know that he had that bottle. And there was this fantastic singer named Mary Coughlin, a friend of mine when I lived in Ireland. Beautiful singer, fantastic person, and uh, she liked to drink. So he would always have her in his dressing room, and she'd like sit there and she'd get drunk while she was talking to him. So he'd at least be around drunk. So I, I never made it into the dressing room to get drunk, but he was, uh, you know, he was, he was just he was such a such a creature, such a cinematic creature. His just the, the way he lifted his arm was poetic visually. You know. I asked this. Of, go ahead, Gil. Oh, what about John Carradine? I had no contact with him oh. because I was the. Uh, I was only there. Well, no, wait. I must have. I don't know. I'd have to watch the movie. If I was in a scene with him, then yeah. I was there. I remember having lunch with Arthur Kennedy and Burgess Mer- Burgess Meredith kept saying, "I live in Malibu." You know, if you're ever in California, I live in Malibu. And I was thinking, why is this guy telling me he lives in Malibu? I don't <laughs> He's and, on you. And look, yeah, now that I look back, yeah. But I was I was a kid, I mean, you know. Burgess Meredith was I, working oh, you. Geez. I live in Malibu, you know. So the penguin I wanted to fuck you. I, I don't, in retrospect, maybe, I don't know. He told me he lived in Malibu a lot. Um, but... Uh, I don't know who knows. Here's the thing. Do you know I was I, I was going to start a hashtag? Why not me too? Because I was never I was never me tooed. No oh, one ever tried to me too. Interesting. Me. Wow. Nope. Yeah. No one ever tried to me too me. Now, one of the reasons is because by the time I I came to Hollywood, I I'd met just I'd met criminals and real you know like. Like I was at the, I'd say certainly working with Ronnie, I was at the core of show business. I was at the direct, you sing a song, they're standing there, you got to do the, you you know what I mean? It was like, it was, I'm not saying it was stand up, which is even more basic, but um, it was so basic that when I met these wealthy and, 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 uh, you know, well-dressed, uh, boys and men who were running Hollywood, it was like, huh, I, those, oh yeah, those guys, kind of guys, you know what I mean? Yeah. You and, were, but you were no I, babe in the woods after experiencing, uh, I was no babe in the woods when I was 17, <laughs> right. but it just, it never came up. And also here's another thing. Here's another thing. I never slept with anybody that I, that I didn't want to. It never would occur to me that that if you slept with somebody, it could make a 
guy, do what you want to do. All I wanted out of, you got to remember that love child background. All I've ever wanted out of men that I've had affairs with was, was them. Mm-hmm. And that relationship and that that love. So the idea, I, I couldn't even look at a guy and think, oh, if I blow him, then I'll, you know, he'll give me the Empire State Building. Just, it's not in my, it's not. No, you know what I mean? It's I just, wish I could it, say it, the it same, wouldn't have Beverly, occurred to me. about my career. It, it really wouldn't have occurred to me. So I maybe I never put out the 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 thing that, that I was even open to that kind of exchange. Now, also, we're not looking at an amazing career, really. You know, I mean, I didn't, I didn't go after stuff. I just got offered stuff. It's still kind of like that. And and you, you know? were you were really close friends with Carrie Fisher. Yeah. Yeah. Very thirty-two years, best friend. Very. You, what do you remember my, about her? Her last text was we were talking about whether it was going to be Christmas at my house and or, and uh, New Year's at hers or vice versa. And she said, I'll see you tomorrow. I was devastated. I loved Carrie. I, 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 everybody, everybody loves Carrie. You know, there's, and she belongs to everybody. Um, but my friendship started with her in the most amazing way, and it reached a level of intimacy that never ended. I never thought of myself as a single mom when I broke up with Al because she was there. Mm, that's nice. And, uh, I mean, she was there. She was my kid's godmother. Uh, but anyway, the way we met is fantastic, okay? So what happened was, now remember I told you I was married for 15 years, but I guess it was an open marriage, you know, for him and for me, so I guess that makes it open. The, with the Duke. With the Duke. Yeah. And so it's 85. And uh, so I was fucking a rock star. I mean, I don't know how else to... Well, I was having an... I thought I was having an affair. And uh, so he called me on this Friday and he said, uh, God, my son's going to listen to this show. Well, hi, this is it. Anyway... um, (laughs) He called me. On, he called me on a Friday. You tell us what to edit, Beverly. Yeah, he called me on a Friday. Just edit anything that isn't entertaining. Okay. We want to reach we'll go, people. We'll, we'll go over it together. But um, so anyway, he called me on a Friday. It was about five o'clock, and he said, uh, "I'm at this charity event, and it's really boring. And they're going to break for dinner soon. Do you have anything to eat?" Now, I want to point out. That do you have anything to eat there is rock star language for Yeah. Do you want to do it? So I said yes. <laughs> and um so I I was making some pasta or something like that. He shows up, yeah, blah 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 blah. And then he's lying there, he goes, you know, I, I gotta go back to this thing. You know, I, I gotta go back. And I, okay, he goes, but look, I want you to spend the night with me. When I uh, um uh, I'll call you when it's over, I'll meet you at the house, because he just lived on Mulholland. Not far from me. And uh, so I go, okay, fine. And I'm kind of luxuriating in the afterglow. And it's like seven, eight, nine, ten, it, 11, 12, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> so I pick up the phone and I called him and I hear like, hello, like, you know, the sleep thing. And I said, <laughs> oh, oh, did I, did I wake you up? And he went, yeah, I'll call you first thing in the morning. So I hang up the phone and I thought, no, 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 cannot be here when he calls. So I, first thing in the morning, I called Murrieta Hot Springs, which has these mud baths. And I booked myself in and got in the car and drove down to Murrieta. Now, Murrieta Hot Springs was this health spa. I think there was a time in the 80s when people, it was before rehabs existed. And a lot of people would go to these health spas on the weekend and eat health food and be very clean and work out. And then they'd go back during the week and snort a bunch of Coke or something. But anyway, so everybody in the industry was always at these places on the weekend. So I go to Murrieta Hot Springs. No phones in the room, but there's one pay phone by the cafeteria where you get your lentil and your lettuce leaf. So everybody's eating dinner. (laughs) And, and, now there's a big long line for the payphone, and I'm in the long line for the payphone too because I had one of those services. You know, I just wanted to hear him say, "Hello, are you there?" there? Yeah. Anyway, you know, for voice messages. Anyway, so in the line, there's like John Peters, all these like you know big big deals, you know, like mm-hmm. hobnobby people, and there's Carrie, 
And she goes, Bev, Bev, we had met earlier at a party where she wanted me to raid somebody's bathroom with her for the medicine cabinet. So I was like, no, man, I'm not, that's not cool. No, no, it's, <laughs> oh, God. no, it's great. It's great. Come on, let's raid. It was Sue Menger's house. And I was like, no, you can't. That's No, you can't do that. You can't do that. Anyway, um, so, our, so we didn't bond then. But now here we are in the middle of nowhere, you know, eating lentils and, and soaking in mud. She goes, come back to my room. Come back to my room. So we're walking back. She said, what are you doing here? I went, oh, it's a long story. What are you doing here? She opens up the door. I'm going to put this in my show, by the way. So if you see my show and this repeats it, okay. just dig okay. it. Just, <laughs> oh, just dig it. Just we will. dig it. So anyway, she opens up the door and her, the floor of her hotel, uh, of her bungalow, was covered with these uh, big yellow uh, legal pads and this loopy writing of hers. And she was there with a guy who was editing her book with her, Paul Slansky. And she had gotten a deal on the, on the tail end of uh, Mommy Dearest. You know, there were like these tell-alls about horrible movie star mothers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So she'd gotten a deal to write to write a memoir. This she it was nineteen eighty five. So what was she like twenty five or something? Anyway, twenty eight. Um, maybe thirty. It doesn't matter. The point is that she was writing a memoir, and she said she was going to call it "Money Dearest." Right, so she was down there just starting to get it together. It was destined to be postcards from the edge, but anyway. So she said, "She goes, so why are you here?" And I said, I'm, "It's it's too long a story." She goes, "Come on, tell me, tell me." So I said, "Well, you know, I'm having an affair with this guy, and he called me yesterday and came over, and he said, you know, I'll call you when I get done and uh, spend the night, and he didn't, and he said he was going to call this morning, so I came down here instead." And she said, "Wait a minute." He called you yesterday. What time? And I said, oh, I don't know. It was like four or five, something like that. He said he was at a charity event and he, you know, <sighs> wanted to take a break from dinner. And then he said he had to go back there. And when I called him, he was asleep. So I just don't want to be around for that guy. I'm playing. I'm going to be hard to get for this, you know. And she said, what was the charity event? And I said, I don't know. Just, she said, <laughs> she said, I was right beside him when you called last night. He went to the charity event with me, and he left saying he had to go somewhere, and he came back, and I went home with him, and I was eating a hamburger when you called at midnight. So we realized it was the same guy. Wow. I'm not telling you who it is. <laughs> Uh, okay, so wow. we realized it was, so then we were instantly best friends, and we made this plan that whoever he called first when we got back to town on Monday would bust him. So he calls me first. <laughs> I'm lying there, and and he's going. So what what happened to you this week? Where'd you go this week? And I said, Oh God, I met the most fantastic woman in the world. She's my new best friend. She's amazing. Her name's Carrie Fisher. <laughs> and he, and he went, uh, and it was literally like like one of those movies, like, okay, okay, Bev, Bev, okay. And it wasn't like he was saying, like, I can explain. It was basically like, okay, that's it. You know, like, I, I'm not going to be busted like this. And she, because she's so fabulous, she I, he kind of it petered out with me. And he was like, hi, you know, across the room from me. I, I didn't care that much. Plus, I was married. But Carrie was just so fascinating that it didn't matter what happened It didn't matter what happened. There was no leaving her. I mean, yes, he was busted, but, you know, even even if she told him, go away, he wouldn't have. Nobody would have because she was just a – there is no (laughs) – it just doesn't exist, you know. This is this is this is this is a very very singular person with an engine mm-hmm. and with a battery that was so unique and so brilliant that it set off sparks and they burned her up. You I'm, know. I'm glad you had, got to have I that wonderful her. friendship, though. For all for, yes, all, for all so those years, did, changed my life. Did you meet Craig through her? Because we obviously Craig yes, uh, Bierko introduced Craig to her. Yeah, I introduced you to her. us. Yeah, she. I yes, think she, I think she she her. said something flattering to Gilbert, didn't she, Gil? Like yeah. Just, before we get we, out of here. We were at a roast together. Mm-hmm. And at one point she just says to me, she looks at me and smiles. Yeah. And she goes, you are just my type. Yeah. And and I said to her, what type is that? And she goes, little cute and funny. Oh, uh, it's true. It's true. About that, Gil. True. Didn't you autumn? Didn't you fall in love with her? Never to fall out. Then. Oh at that yeah. Point? Yeah. I mean, it's just it. It can't. It was, poets must describe it. Novelists must describe it. 
I wrote a song about her, but I don't have a piano, so I can't play it. Otherwise, I would. Okay. Uh, you know. <laughs> tell, <laughs> tell us what you tell us about the podcast you're going to do. Tell us you're still singing. I don't know. You're I still look, s- it's been going for a year. I'm insane. I need help. Help! Help! Help me. Well, what happened was a, a year ago, a, a, a friend of mine, Moon Zappa, said, you got to do a podcast, you got to do a podcast, you're, you know, a talkaholic, it's your medium. And plus, I really do believe that podcasts are what's happening right now. This is like radio. Yeah, you know, I think it radio, is your medium, first, by the way, Beverly. This, this, well, I'm into it. So anyway, I couldn't figure out what to focus on. And then I got this obsession about Steve Perry before his album came out. <laughs> and I was just obsessed with him. And my friend Charlie Wester said... He said, that's your podcast. And I said, about Steve Perry, my obsession <laughs> with Steve Perry. He said, no, just your, just the way your mind works, you know. And so originally I was going to call it, I'm Bev D'Angelo and I'm obsessed and then have dot, dot, dot with. But, you know, as it evolved and I became more adult about it and, and you know, discarded the Steve Perry thing because a horrible thing happened. But he, I'll tell you later. Anyway, um, <laughs> it's, I, I think I'm going to call it um, uh, specifically. Or, 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 or specifically speaking. Okay. Because the guests that I interview, I like to do a deep dive into them, like a really deep dive into them and their 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 profession. And I've done eight so far, but I just want them to be so good. And the next one I want to do is I'm going to call it the Council of Women. I've got four fantastic women that I'm going to get together to talk about. These are all women who have really achieved in their field, which is which are all male dominated fields. One is the world of coding, you know, um, mm-hmm. computer coding. Mm-hmm. The other is uh, management, managed all the acts in, in uh, Motown, modeling, Lauren Hutton, and I, and I want to get Lorraine because what I want to talk about is that stuff that you learn just in living that 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 isn't taught to you. But it's like internecine, uh, you know, it, it's like uh, deep inside knowledge that, that I think women should be sharing with other women. Yeah. Because if, for example, Harvey Weinstein had jerked off in front of somebody and and that actress was coming from a culture where she had women saying, hey, listen, watch out for that guy. Or if a guy does this, do that, that, and that, you know, who knows what would have happened? Because I, I think that, you know, especially now women are being so... It's like a moment where, where women are saying, listen to our experience, listen to what happens to us, listen, in, in general. You know, I'm actually working with Alyssa Milano. So that sounds like a good idea for a podcast. I don't think anybody's doing it. And we love Lurleen Lumpkin, by the way. Isn't she the best? And talk about full circle. That's one of my favorite characters on one of my favorite shows. Me too. Yeah. Me too. And those are terrific songs you wrote. Gil? Thank you. Well. I'm, this has been Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast. I'm Gilbert Gottfried with my co-host Frank Santo Padre. And we started out, I was a little disappointed because we had a guinea on the show. And I, I don't like to talk to them. About time. But so it bloody turned bad. out. That she was We're good people, act- right, Frank? Yeah, absolutely. But it turned out she was actually Moses. <laughs> <laughs> so she won me over that I mean, I'm yeah. talking to Moses. <laughs> so for well, a Jew, this is quite an accomplishment. <laughs> it's, uh, it's been my pleasure. I just love you. Uh, I, I love you. And now I'm in love with you too, Frank. So oh, you're... Hey. Be still my gems. heart. Yeah. I just blushed. We have been <laughs> talking to the wonderful Beverly D'Angelo. Beverly, we got 12 cards here. We barely got into the deep woods. So when you launch the show, will you come back to plug it? Not only will I come back to plug it, I'll come back with bells on. I, I mean, okay. I'd be absolutely thrilled. This has been a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. I can't think of anybody else I'd want to spend it with. This has been heaven. You're a doll. Oh, thank you for thank doing this. You. And thank you to Bierko for setting this up. I know. Let's hear, hear it for Craig Bierko. We, we love the guy. And and now, to to lead us out, the cunnilingus chimps. <laughs> oh, oh, the music? <laughs> the music for the chimps? Play it. <laughs>